Thank you very much. And thank you for the kind of invitation to come and speak today. So I do indeed have a joint post. I'm a hematologist managing the transfusion service in a set of London hospitals, and I also work for the National Blood Service in England. So whole blood can be split into its component parts or th these components can be collected by apheresis. And this allows us to embark on targeted therapy for all sorts of clinical conditions associated with anemia, thrombocytopenia, and coagulopathy. And these are some of the conditions that I'm going to be talking about today. But let's not forget that plasma from several hundreds of patients can be pulled and then fractionated by largely pharmaceutical processes to make quite a lot of products listed in the blue writing there. Although clearly important, we won't have time to talk about these today. Now, before we embark on the use of appropriate use of clinical components, really quite important to emphasize that this just fits into the wider picture of clinical blood transfusion practice within hospitals. So pivotal to this, is correct patient identification, taking the, the right sample from the right patient, through to the laboratory with grouping and antibody testing, selecting the right component for your patient with the right special requirements, ensuring safe transit from the laboratory to the clinical area, maintaining the cold cha chain, appropriately transfusing these components, and part and parcel of that is careful monitoring of the patients and recognizing adverse reactions, which should be managed appropriately and indeed reported to the hemovigilance system. So in the UK, we have the, the hemovigilance system as the serious hazards of transfusion or the SHOT scheme. And SHOT does a sterling job. It collects data from different hospitals. It collates this together, analyzes, and then very important feeds back results to improve transfusion safety. And SHOT has been collecting data for now for 15 years. So this is a sum summary pie chart. There's lots of acronyms there, and all of those are available to, to have a look at the, sh the SHOT website. The address is shown there. So for example, over the years, we can see that transfusion transmitted infection, very important, but it's not particularly common in the UK. There are many other adverse events which we need to sit up and take notice. For example, this big blue bar here is incorrect blood component transfused. So this is where errors have been made, where patients have not received special requirements for their particular indication and disease group. So clinical decision making starts off with choosing the right component, and here we have to be clear about what the clinical indication is and what is your patient group. So for example, in major hemorrhage, in all sorts of clinical settings, trauma, surgery, obstetrics, one would need to use red cells, plasma, and platelets. Oncology patients are big users of red cells and platelets. And here we have to remember their special requirements. So for example, the use of irradiated blood to avoid the risk of grass versus host disease. Patients with hemoglobinopathy have very high risk of forming red cell antibodies, particularly sickle patients, with the series indicating about 30% of these patients would form red cell antibodies. So in this group, perhaps it's not enough just to do ABO and D-typing, and we should be carrying out more extending matching of red cells provided, for example, extended RH and KEL typing. And then let's not forget our pediatric and our neonatal group, and in fact, the fetus in the womb is, after all, one of our patients, so intrauterine transfusion. And here, there are special requirements which we must adhere to. For example, in terms of the age of blood, we would certainly use fresher red cells for our very young patients and the hematocrit. Okay, so it would be great to have guidelines encompassing many of these recommendations. So one such committee producing guidelines is indeed the British Committee for Standards in Hematology in the UK, and which produces guidelines and lots of different aspects of hematology are shown. All the guidelines are published in journals and available at open access to download for your use at this particular website. And the Transfusion Task Force is a multidisciplinary task force with representation from various professional bodies and we produce guidelines on both the clinical and laboratory use of blood. Now, 
these guidelines are very useful in terms of distilling quite a lot of evidence and producing recommendations we can then use in our clinical settings. But it's really quite important that any recommendation that we use, we are aware of the strength of evidence behind that recommendation. So, for example, the grade mechanism here, we state the strength of the recommendation and indeed the quality of evidence. So, for example, if there are good randomized controlled clinical trials, then the quality of evidence is graded as high. But there are many fields that we don't have the evidence. And the question is, what do we do there? And if we want to produce pragmatic guidance, we still can do, but we need to indicate that the level of evidence behind these particular recommendations is actually really quite low. Now, working in the field of hematology and transfusion, clearly we have to interact with many colleagues, and our guideline writing should reflect that. So, for example, we've recently completed a guideline in conjunction with the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in the UK on the management of red cell antibodies in pregnancy. This is absolutely red hot off the press. It's now been printed and it's available to download from the RCOG website. And indeed, there are many, many excellent transfusion initiatives in lots of different countries. Here are just a few examples you may want to have a look at. And in fact, the ISBT Academy is now pulling together transfusion guidelines, and that will be available in its members' area. And we now have, a, we indeed have a clinical transfusion working party, and we're actually currently trying to pull together resources for patient blood management. And that, we have an educational update on behalf of that working party. And in fact, it's actually going to be here tomorrow at 8.30. So if you're interested in this subject, please do come along. So in relation to making appropriate decisions around component use, we need to apply the principles of patient blood management. We need to think about the indications, consider the risks, benefits, and in particular, think of transfusion avoiding strategies. Some of these are actually summarized here. For example, the use of intravenous iron. The picture here is a, an intraoperative cell saver. And there are many other ways that we can avoid or restrict transfusion use, both in med medical and surgical patients. Of course, if patients need transfusion, we do need to go forth and transfuse. But there's very much a move towards restrictive transfusion therapy. So, for example, in relation to red cells, the TRIC study, Transfusion Requirements and Critical Care, now this is really quite an old study back in 1998, which showed that patients randomized to restrictive transfusion certainly did not have any worse outcome than a liberal transfusion strategy. And this study has been absolutely pivotal in changing our practice, not just in critical care, but also beyond. Now, it's great to see more randomized controlled trials come forward. So, for example, in the field of uh, hip surgery, the FOCUS study, cardiac surgery, the TRAC study, and indeed upper GI bleeding. Now, there is a talk later this afternoon by uh, Dr. Carson specifically on red cell transfusion triggers, so I'm not going to go through this data in a detailed way, which will be covered later. So, in relation to decision-making, clearly we must be clear as to what the indication and the trigger is. And here, the key principle, of course, which we all, of course, recognize, is that we do not just treat a laboratory value. We don't transfuse patients just because they have a particular hemoglobin, platelet count, or a coagulation screen. It's essential, of course, to undertake clinical assessment and to use the laboratory values in conjunction with that before we make the decision. The other issue is we should only, of course, it's common sense, but it's surprising how often it's not practiced we should only give what the patient needs for their benefit without over-transfusing, which unnecessarily uses a precious resource and exposes patients to unnecessary risk of adverse events. So, for example, in the UK, we undertook a large audit of transfusion in medical patients, and there were many instances where patients were transfused not just at a fairly high hemoglobin threshold, they seemed to be over-transfused with very high post-transfusion hemoglobin levels. And this certainly promotes the sentiment that we should be maybe using single unit transfusions, not just for red cells, but also for platelets in non-bleeding patients. And once you give your single unit, reassess and then decide whether or not further transfusion is needed. And in all this decision-making, clearly we mustn't forget 
the patient. The patient should be informed and wherever possible informed, involved in the decision-making process, which is after all what valid consent entails. We've just completed quite a large audit of patient information and consent of 2,000 patients and frankly there is much more we could be doing and our practice is not as good as we would like to think it is. So of course there are many guidelines and policies which encapsulate these but audit repeatedly shows that there is variation in practice and there's inappropriate use. Lots of large audits of use of um, red cells plasma platelets, the figure shows about 25 to 30 percent of components are inappropriately used. So clearly we need guidelines themselves are not enough. We need to be doing much more in terms of aiding implementation. Certainly there is a rule, a need for us to be looking at better education and training to inform particularly our trainee doctors who do prescribe a lot of components. And a need really to look at more IT support tools, for example, computerized decision support making at the bedside to help guide component use. This of course is limited by availability of resources and it's certainly not widely available. I think it's fair to acknowledge that there has been quite a fundamental change in transfusion practice over the years. So certainly in the UK, we've had a reduction of about 15 to 20 percent in our red cell usage, and this is over a period of about 15 to 20 years. Although it appears to be plateauing, there is still a, a more gradual downward drift with the later figures. And also where blood is used, there seems to be significant changes. So for example, this audit which was done in 2009, and actually it's just been reported, so the two, this is supported by 2014 data, that only about a third of red cells, about 30%, are now used for surgical indications. The large proportion of red cells are actually used for medical indications. So many of our uh, practices in relation to uh, red cell avoidance have really kicked in in surgery, but it's time to focus more on medical usage. What's quite interesting, of course, is that platelet or plasma use certainly has not declined. If anything, these are possibly increasing. And since we know that audits show quite a lot of inappropriate use, clearly this needs greater scrutiny. So data is pretty powerful in terms of comparing practice, and it's not just comparing practice within clinicians, within hospitals, within the country, there is data now increasingly available comparing practice between countries, which is actually really quite interesting. And I'm very grateful to Steve Morgan for this slide. And so this chart shows red cell issues per thousand population for several countries. The majority of these are in Europe, but this, it also includes Australia. And there are three different bars for each country for successive years. The blue bar is the latest of these. And a lot of the blue bars, certainly on this end, show a reduction in red cell usage, which is quite interesting. But still, I think what this clearly emphasizes, that there's a huge amount of variation in terms of red cell usage per capita population in different countries. And there's almost a twofold variation from 20 up to 50. This variation is also seen in platelet and plasma use, although I haven't shown you the data. Okay, so moving on to platelet transfusions. So these are, of course, stored at ambient temperatures, we've heard, and consequently, it's a shorter shelf life. So within hospitals, unless you're actually linked to a blood center, it's probably quite unlikely that you have a huge number of platelets on, on the shelf. We're a large trauma center, and we wouldn't stock too many platelets because that would uh, increase wastage. And that's really quite important to take into account when you're clinically managing patients, particularly in high-risk you know, indications such as major hemorrhage. A lot of platelets are used for hemato-oncology, and it's really good to see increasing evidence in the use of platelets in this setting. So many national guidelines will now state that for prophylaxis in hemato-oncology patients, one should be using a trigger of 10. Unfortunately, there isn't that much evidence base supporting platelet triggers in the context of other indications, particularly, for example, surgery and procedures. But clearly, we need some sort of pragmatic guidelines to guide use within hospitals. And, as, and this is just fairly pragmatic guideline supported by evidence, uh, not supported by evidence, but supported by practice and experience. So a lot of platelets are used for hemato-oncology. And in fact, in the UK, about 60% of platelets are used for hemato-oncology. And this very large audit 
undertaken in about 3,000 patients, again shows huge amount of variation and inappropriate use. Probably about just about 30% of platelets possibly were not indicated, which is quite a high proportion, I would say. One particular area for improvement in practice is not using double-dose platelets for prophylaxis, and that is actually supported by very good clinical data, the study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the reference that I've shown here. And this is something that we really must be encouraging our colleagues not to do, particularly junior doctors. And maybe the, the, the mantra here should be, why use two when one will do? There is no indication for double-dose platelets in prophylactic use in non-bleeding patients. The really sort of interesting debate going on at the moment is do we need platelets at all for prophylaxis in hematology patients undergoing chemotherapy? And the top study attempted to tackle this, looking at prophylaxis versus no prophylaxis. It was unable to show non-inferiority for no prophylaxis. I think with emerging evidence and further subgroup analysis, the debate is going to carry on, and I don't think practice will be change certainly at present in relation to that. So in relation to plasma components, it's fair to say that there is very little evidence to guide effective usage. There are various national pragmatic guidelines. In the UK, we actually recommend that FFP is not used for warfarin reversal. Prothrombin complex concentrate is a much better standardized product for this setting. I'll come to cryoprecipitate in a minute when we talk about the last strand of my talk, which is actually major hemorrhage. So we can encounter major hemorrhage in lots of different clinical settings, trauma, obstetrics, GI bleed, just to name a few. And this is a potentially hugely fraught, high-risk situation. And we need to be pretty clear as to the approach we want to take you know, for an, a successful patient outcome. There has been quite a lot of focus, particularly on traumatic coagulopathy and major hemorrhage but it's fair to say that the principles of management applied to all settings. Really quite important, of course, is communication between key teams, and breakdown in communication is a really, really important source of serious adverse events. Definitive management involves rapid identification of bleeding, and there's now very much a focus on focused ultrasound scanning, CT scans, for example, to diagnose hemoperitoneum pneumo or hemothorax. And this should be followed by control of bleeding as quickly as possible. Time is off the essence here. And this could be either in the form of definitive surgery or indeed, if needed, damage control surgery. And interventional radiology, in fact, has an increasingly important role in terms of controlling bleeding in lots of different settings, trauma, obstetric surgery. In terms of transfusion support, it's clearly, really quite important that we have a clear viewpoint as to how we provide blood and components when we provide this, and what actually guides our management. So for example, in traumatic hemorrhage, about 40% of major trauma deaths are actually due to hemorrhage. So we have a real role to play here in terms of improving patient outcomes. So at the Royal London Hospital, which is one of the hospitals where I work, the trauma patients may either be brought in by the ambulance or by the scooped up by the air ambulance service, and a trauma call triggers quite a large team here. Now, the team may be quite small, but the principles are still the same. Quite essential that the team works together in a functional manner, and a team leader can assist with this. There's also another really important team working away that you can't see, but communication is by telephone, and that's the transfusion laboratory. So I think the team leader here should nominate a coordinator to speak to the transfusion lab to quickly and accurately communicate requirements for blood and components. If not, there is a potential for poor communication and you know, the appropriate components not reaching the clinical arena. Of course, red cells are needed as quickly as possible, and it's really important to have a policy as to how much you provide and when. So before the blood group is available while it's been undertaken, group O certainly will need to be issued and group O negative in particular for women of childbearing age, with a switch to ABO-specific blood as quickly as possible. Now, the Royal London, we have a lot of trauma, and we've had quite a lot of serious adverse events where there were concerns that blood wasn't provided as quickly as possible. So we've actually got a remote issue fridge actually 
in the emergency area with electronic tracking of blood. Now, of course, this is not needed for all centers or, or, or desirable or available, but it clearly within every acute hospital, it's important to be clear what the policy is and where clinicians can access uh, emergency blood. Now, about 25 to 30 percent of patients with major trauma presenting to the A&E department will have coagulopathy. This is even before, this is not dilutional, this is before they've been transfused. And in fact, the, the phrase that's been coined to describe this is acute traumatic coagulopathy. There's a few other phrases in the literature. And these patients have a very poor outcome. And in fact, mortality worsens with worsening coagulopathy. Now, the traditional management of coagulopathy and trauma has been to give fresh frozen plasma based on laboratory tests. But unfortunately, laboratory tests take time. And the question is, is that delay acceptable to the management of your patient? And the graph there, in fact, shows our turnaround times for the prothrombin time in our hospital, which is really too long and I would say unacceptable. Now, this has actually prompted increasing use of near patient testing and coagulation. So, for example, this rotational thromboelastometry shown here. But if these are used, it's clearly essential to have validated protocols to ensure effective use. Now, for a while, there has been quite an ongoing raging debate, in fact, on what is the optimum blood component ratio. You may have heard of this. Should we be using one-to-one -one red cells to FFP? And there are now a huge number of publications, but greater scrutiny of these publications will indicate that a lot of these studies are actually retrospective, and there are real concerns about methodology, and we should be a bit cautious about translating these to clinical practice pending prospective studies. So really, the recommendation here would be, let's not use one-to-one -one ratios at present. However, we must promote early use of plasma and the European Trauma Guidelines, for example, recommends a ratio of one to two of uh, red cells to FFP. Entirely empirical, but we're not trying to really aggressively use a one-to-one -one ratio. If you're interested in this subject, I would strongly recommend that you do read this European Trauma Guideline. Once again, it's available by open access freely on the internet. So patients who bleed will need, probably need fibrinogen replacement, ideally, to keep the fibrogen level greater than 1.5. I've just summarized very briefly some of the different products that are available to correct fibrinogen. So certainly one can use fresh frozen plasma, but you need quite a large volume to correct the fibrinogen level. The product that we use in the UK is cryoprecipitate, which provides a more concentrated form of fibrinogen. And many countries, of course, don't have cryo and they will use fibrinogen concentrate. We do have fibrogen concentrate available in the UK, but it's not actually licensed for major hemorrhage. I mean, clearly we need some comparative studies which are not forthcoming. And the big question here, which people are debating, is should we be more aggressive about replacing fibrogen earlier in the hemorrhage process? And this certainly would need some good, well-structured study to inform that debate. I think the use of tranexamic acid, though, in major hemorrhage should not incur too much debate, we would argue. So I hope that we're all aware of the CRASH-2 study, a very large study in 40 countries, 20,000 patients, which clearly shows that tranexamic acid given early for traumatic hemorrhage saves lives. And tranexamic acid may be actually useful in other clinical settings. This is certainly not the case for recombinant 7A, which is terribly expensive. Tranexamic acid is very, very cheap. Recombinant 7A is really very expensive, and despite a plethora of publications, there are concerns about its clinical use and its safety, and there is very little limited in indication for use of recombinant 7A. So in the context of major hemorrhage, one could argue that any acute hospital must have a clear explicit policy which clinical teams are familiar with. Now, we spend a lot of time talking to our clin clinical colleagues, and I would certainly urge you to produce policies for clinical use that are as simple as possible. A lot of debate actually resulted in this fairly simple flow diagram, which our trauma teams are actually very familiar with.
So this starts off with trigger of the major hemorrhage, emphasizing that baseline samples must be taken before giving components, early use of tranexamic acid, the use of a team leader to coordinate management, the use of a coordinator to liaise with the lab, some sort of empirical early use. For, for our center, we use six units of red cells and four units of FFP. I'm not saying that's right, but that's what we tend to use, and the trauma team is very familiar with this. And then further management based on results of laboratory tests if they're available, and then deciding on empirical issue if laboratory tests aren't available and our patient carries on bleeding. So this, as with any other guideline, of course, needs to be supported by education and training and indeed audit. So I've um, told you about quite a few guidelines on how to access these as I've gone along with the, through my talk. There is another resource that I would like to recommend if you'd like to have a look at it. Certainly, um, ha there are many countries have produced handbooks of transfusion medicine. In the UK, we've just updated ours. It's actually red hot off the press in 2014. You can either have it as a handbook to carry around, or it's actually available free of charge to download at this particular website. And it's got lots of useful, practical clinical tips for transfusion. So I'd like to finish there with just a few acknowledgements of colleagues. Thank you for your attention.